Good afternoon. Today, we are here for a discussion that pertains to the lives and beliefs of millions of people around the world, one that affects both Muslims and non-Muslims alike. While you may not believe in the message of Islam in the Quran, you still live in a world where 1.8 billion Mus Muslims do. It is a fair question to know the possible threats and issues of the world we, in which we live. And with the threat of terrorism around the world, specifically the groups that disrupt peace and threaten lives in the name of Islam, it is essential to understand where these ideologies arise and if they are at all related to the Holy Scripture. The question to be answered today is, does the Quran promote peace? Answering in the affirmative, we have Ayatollah Sahawat Hussain and Sayyid Atif Ibadi. Answering in the negative, we have David Wood and Robert Spencer. We would like each panelist to briefly introduce themselves to the audience, beginning with our guest panel of David Wood and Robert Spencer. Did you just want like, hi, I'm David, or like? Uh... Can you just oh, hi, I'm David. Um, started studying Islam because my uh, best friend in college um, wanted to show me that Islam is true, and so I started studying then, and um, eventually he left Islam, and I thought I was done with Islam. I, that was the only reason I was uh, studying Islam. And uh, afterwards, Muslims started challenging me to debate, so I'm still, um, still involved. Oh. Hi, I'm Robert. I suppose since David told you why he started studying this, I will too. My uh, grandparents were exiled from the last caliphate, the Ottoman Empire, for uh, declining the invitation to convert to Islam. And uh, I was fascinated by their stories growing up and wanted to learn about why that had happened and what exactly was going on. And, so I began to read the Quran and to study, and certainly uh, I'm sure we all can agree that if the Quran does promote peace, then there's an awful lot of misunderstanding of that among Muslims, but we'll of course discuss that soon. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. This is Dr. Sakhavat Hussain. I am a humble servant of Islam and a humble student of Quran. I have been promoting peace, unity among the human beings, particularly the revealed religions. I am graduate of Qum Seminary. Also, I am graduate of Naulakha Church. I studied over there Christianity at Lahore as well as Islam at Qum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters. My name is Sayyid Atik Ibadi, and I am the Imam and leader of religious services at Mosque of Imam Ali in the Pensalk in New Jersey, and also the head of the Imam Mahdi Interfaith Center here in Philadelphia. Before we begin, our audience should remember that food and refreshments will be available throughout the length of today's program. When leaving or coming back to your seat, please do as quietly as possible. We will begin with 20-minute 20 20 minute presentations from both sides, followed by 10-minute rebuttals, a break, a question and answer session, and we will end with closing statements. We will start with 20-minute presentation from each panel. The time of 20 minutes refers to the total presentation time for each panel. David Wood and Robert, David Wood and Robert Spencer will both present for a total of 20 minutes, and Saeed Atif will be the sole pre presenter for his panel for 20 minutes. We ask the audience to please silence and turn off all electronic devices at this time and please remain silent during the presentations. You may applaud at the end of each presentation. Any interruption from the panelists or the audience will result in time being added to the speaker's presentation. I will indicate the time remaining during each presentation and when the time has ended. We will now ask our guest panel to present for 20 minutes. Good afternoon. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Syed Atik for uh, arranging this debate. It's becoming increasingly difficult in our time to have 
uh, open discussions about very difficult topics because people start, uh, become very quick to start calling each other names and shouting each other, uh, shouting each other down. So it's refreshing to have uh, a Muslim organization actually challenging two handsome geniuses to come in here and argue that the Quran does not promote peace. Uh, unfortunately, the handsome geniuses couldn't make it, so uh, stuck with Robert and me. Uh, but my point here is that um, just because we, we disagree, and we are going to disagree, doesn't mean that, that we uh, don't respect each other. And uh, I've, I've always respected debaters. Even if I disagree with them on every other thing, I respect the fact that they're willing to stand up here and defend their beliefs and respond to objections and criticisms. Um, I've been studying Islam, um, I guess I, I started studying a little bit in the, in the 90s, but that was more secondary sources. I started uh, going through the Muslim sources, um, I guess, 15, 16 years ago, something like that. So I've been studying Islam for uh, a while, and as far, I don't really see much room for confusion about the role of violence in the Muslim sources. So I'm going to sort of um, just give a quick overview of, of what I think about Islam as far as what I think that Islam teaches. And uh, uh, I've, I will, of course, be corrected um, later if I'm wrong. So the word Islam, start from the basics here. The word Islam means submission. A Muslim is one who submits. And submission here refers to submission to Allah. But Allah doesn't just tell you that you must submit to Allah. It tells you how you must submit to Allah. And you submit to Allah by unquestioningly obeying the commands of Allah found in the Quran and the teachings and example of Muhammad found in uh, the Hadith. And you demonstrate your submission by believing certain things and by uh, doing certain things. So this is similar to other religions. So. Uh, in Islam, you would be required to believe certain things about Allah, angels, uh, revealed books, prophets, and so on. And you would be required to perform certain deeds, such as um, reciting the Shahada, saying your five daily prayers, things like that. So you have to do certain things and believe certain things. Now, if Islam is a collection of beliefs and practices, how would this be different from other religions? Well, in the Quran, chapter 9, verse 29, for instance, Allah commands Muslims to fight those who do not believe in Allah, nor the day of judgment. And those are two of the, um, two of the pillars of, I mean, two of the uh, uh, required articles of faith. So it's a command to fight people based on what they believe about certain things. And in the Hadith, uh, Sahih Muslim, number 129, for instance, Muhammad said that he'd been commanded to fight people until they say that there's no God but Allah, until they perform the daily prayers and give the prescribed alms. Notice the practices. He's commanded to fight over the practices. So Allah commands Muslims to fight over the beliefs, and Muhammad commands Muslims to fight over the practices. Hence, jihad. Right? That's where, that's where jihad, there are different kinds of jihad, but uh, that is an important one of them, people who refuse to submit are to, are to be fought until they submit. Now, I understand that there are lots of Muslims who don't agree with those last few sentences I said about being required to uh, fight, at least in certain circumstances, not in all circumstances, but being required in certain circumstances when, um, when the Muslim community is able to fight people based on their beliefs and practices. I understand there are lots of Muslims who don't agree with that, and so the question is, uh, how do they respond to what Allah and Muhammad said in the Muslim sources? And I see three basic ways of responding, and one of the, the basic ways of responding is uh, by reinterpreting, reinterpreting commands in the Quran. So if you open up the, uh, something in the Quran and you, and you don't happen to like it, you can, you can interpret it in some other way. Uh, especially if it has something to do with violence. So chapter 4, verse 34, if you fear rebellion from your wife, you can admonish her, banish her to a separate bed, and beat her. Now when I ask my Muslim friends, what does that mean? What does it mean by, you know, you could, as a last resort, beat her? Um, they tell me that it means you tap her lightly with a toothbrush on the shoulder to show your displeasure. Now, my Muslim friends seem perfectly satisfied with that as a response, but I'm sitting back there wondering when I hear this, 
if Allah meant tap them lightly on the shoulder with a toothbrush, why not say tap them lightly on the shoulder with a toothbrush? I mean, there, there are perfectly good Arabic words for saying that sort of thing. So why say the thing that sounds like it's telling you it's okay to beat your wife? Why say that instead of what, what you really meant? And that's the problem with this response. Over and over again in the Quran, Allah claims to be perfectly clear in his commandments. So when Allah says something, Allah had all eternity to get that exactly the way he wanted, to say exactly what he was commanding you to do. So when a Muslim comes in and says, yes, what Allah said was this, but he really meant something else, it sounds like you're claiming to be more clear than Allah in his perfectly clear word. And that sounds somewhat strange to me, and it sounds strange to uh, many Muslims. So that's one way of responding and, and the problem I see with it. Uh, the next way of, of responding is uh, what, I, what I would call the, the context defense. Namely that, yes, you can, you can look at verses of the Quran and uh, they sound violent, but if you look at the surrounding verses, you'll see that it's not, it's not, uh, it's not violent at all or it's promoting just fighting and self-defense. And just, just to be clear, I'm a big fan of context. You can distort any book, the Quran or any other book, by ripping words out of context. You could distort my words right now by taking something I just said, completely ripping it out of context and making it sound like I said something else. So it is a correct criticism that context is important. Uh, and there are v the verses where this is perfectly relevant. Um, when people point out chapter two, verse 191 of the Quran, um, slay them wherever you find them, it is relevant to point out that a verse earlier, a verse earlier, uh, Allah refers to fighting people who are fighting you. So that, that there's, there's an ongoing fight. It's not talking about just walking out and killing someone in the street out, outside this church, for instance. So context is relevant, passages like that. The problem is there are other places in the Quran where you can read the context all day long. And you can look at the literary context, that's the verses that come around it. You can look at the historical context and the verse turns out to mean exactly what it sounds like it means. Fight those who do not believe in Allah or the last day is one of those verses. There's nothing in the context about people attacking you. Nothing historical or literary context, nothing about anyone attacking you. Uh, it's about fighting people based on what they believe. So the context doesn't help here. And the third basic response is for uh, Muslims to go to passages of the Quran uh, which do say something. Um, which do say something peaceful. So um, if, if you are a Muslim and someone disagrees with you, you are to say, to you be your religion and to me be my religion. Well, that sounds peaceful. Uh, there's no compulsion in religion. That sounds peaceful. Those, those sound good. Now what's the problem here? Well, the, the problem here is those are not sort of the final marching orders of Allah or Muhammad. Um, when we go to the life of Muhammad, we see a pattern emerge. And it's the same pattern we find in the Quran, it's the same pattern we find in the Hadith. Namely, that when Muhammad was completely outnumbered in Mecca, and any sort of confrontation with the unbelievers, any sort of physical fighting could have resulted in the Muslim community just being wiped out, Muslims were told to preach a message of, of, of peace and tolerance, don't even fight, don't fight even in self-defense. Later, Muslims left Mecca, went to Medina, and were able to form some alliances, had some more um, had some more, uh, a lot more people on their side. And then the message changed to fight those who fight you. That's when, that's when you're fighting people, but the other people have to start the fighting. And so here you have what's, what's called defensive jihad. You fight jihad, but it's, it's for defensive purposes. The other, the other groups have to do something uh, to start it. But those are not the final marching orders. There is a later period when Muslims have the dominant position in society, they have the upper hand, they have the, the, the most and the, the strongest community. And that's when the commands change from fight those who fight you to fight those who do not believe. Now you have the subjugation of, uh, of non-Muslims and non-Muslim groups. So the peaceful verses of the Quran um, that are used to show that Islam doesn't, uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't call for violence against unbelievers, um, those also fall prey to the context response. You say, what's the context of there's no compulsion in religion? Where's, what's the context of these other verses? And you find that once you put all of the various Muslim teachings into a, a logical order, 
you get a pattern that emerges. And the final marching orders are for when Muslims are in a position to subjugate others, and then they are called on to do so. Again, I'm not saying Muslims in here agree with that, uh, but that is what Islam teaches as far as I can tell. And to expand upon some of this, we'll have Robert Spencer. Thank you, David. Thank you all for being here. And as David is saying, uh, there is a certain progression in the development of the Quran's teaching on relationship with unbelievers. And he cited chapter 109, Surah 109 of the Quran, which says, to say to the unbelievers, you have your religion, and we have ours, and essentially we'll leave each other alone. And then you have defensive jihad and offensive jihad. Offensive jihad being based solely on fighting unbelievers because they are unbelievers. And thus it is not defensive until there are no more unbelievers left to fight. They have all been converted or subjugated under the rule of Islam or killed. This is not an eccentric understanding of Islam. This was first formulated by Ibn Ishaq, who was Muhammad's first biographer and who wrote his biography of Muhammad in the middle part of the 8th century. And all the biographies of Muhammad since then, both friendly and unfriendly to him, have been based on Ibn Ishaq because he contains material that other people simply don't have. He's the earliest available source. And he was aware, as many of the early Muslims were aware, that there was a certain discrepancy in the Quran's teaching on jihad and on relationship, the relationship with unbelievers. Sometimes it was saying you get along with them and coexist and speak to them more eloquent words than they are speaking to you and so on. And other times it's saying go to war. And so he explained that there was a progression from tolerance to defensive jihad to offensive jihad as the final stage. And this was based on the idea in the Quran that the different surahs from Mecca and from Medina, Mecca being the first part of Muhammad's prophetic career when he was based in Mecca and was a, a preacher of religious ideas without any political or military power, and Medina later being where he settled and became a military and political leader as well as a religious one, that the Medinan verses coming chronologically later cancel out or have supersede or have a superior authority to the verses from Mecca. This doesn't, of course, mean that anything is taken out of the Quran or uh, blot blotted out altogether. It's a matter of, as generally the Islamic scholars uh, have explained, it is starting with Ibn Ishaq and going up through Ibn Qayyim and Ibn Kathir and uh, the Tafsir al-Jalalain, which is one of the mainstream commentaries on the Quran, of course, among Sunni Muslims, and uh, all the way up to the 20th century, you have uh, the idea based on chapter 2, verse 106 of the Quran, whenever we abrogate a verse or cause it to be forgotten, we will supply one that is uh, just as good or better. That what comes chronologically later takes precedence over what comes chronologically earlier, and only when the circumstances of the earlier period are replicated are those passages in force. What I mean is this, that when Muhammad was preaching you have your religion and we have ours, as in Surah 109, the Muslims were small and powerless. So when Muslims are small and a powerless group, they preach, you have your religion, we have ours, Islam is peace. But as they grow in power, just as Muhammad grew in power and began to teach first, fight those who fight you, as in chapter 2, verse 190, and then fight until religion is all for Allah, is in chapter 8, verse 39, then the defensive and then offensive jihad, they kick in. Now I should also add, uh, just to make sure that we understand each other at this point, that many people will say, no, 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 jihad is spiritual altogether. And that is very clearly something that is adamantly rejected by the Quran itself. For example, the Quran says in chapter 4, verse 95, not equal are those of the believers who sit at home, except those who are disabled. And those who strive hard, that is, wage jihad, jihada, the, the, the verb there, and fight in the cause of Allah with their wealth and their lives. Obviously, if jihad were solely, certainly jihad does have the sense of being a spiritual struggle within the soul to better oneself 
and bring one's life into conformity with the will of Allah. But if that were all that it was, then a verse like this would make no sense because it's saying, strive hard. Those who, who, who sit at home are not equal to those who fight with their wealth in their lives. A spiritual struggle does not ordinarily involve one's wealth and one's life. Actually, it does ordinarily involve sitting at home and praying and devoting oneself to spiritual exercises and devotions and so on. And so, of course, there are many other indications that it's much more than a spiritual struggle, as in chapter 8, verse 41, know that whatever of the war booty you may gain, verily one-fifth is assigned to Allah and to the messenger and to the near relatives of the messenger and the orphans. Obviously, there's no spoils of war arising from a spiritual struggle. That's a hot warfare, clearly, in which prisoners are taken, their property is seized, and so on. This is underscored by a hadith in which Muhammad says, I have been commanded to fight against people until they confess that there is no God but Allah and I am his messenger. And when they do, their lives and their property are safe from me and my followers. In other words, as long as the people confess that there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger, their lives and property are safe. But if they do not confess that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, and there is no God but Allah, then their lives and property are not safe. They can be seized by the Muslims. And of course, the Hadith are full of accounts of various occasions in which exactly that happened, and there were various uh, controversies among the Muslims as to uh, what they should do, how the spoils should be distributed, what should be done with prisoners of war, and so on. So the primary question here is, not about a spiritual struggle, but about the nature of the warfare. And in that case, you come to something like chapter 8, verse 39 that I mentioned, where it says, fight until religion is all for Allah. And chapter 9, verse 29 that David mentioned, in which the Muslims are commanded to fight against even the people of the book, which is, of course, the Quran's term primarily for Jews and Christians, until they pay the jizya, the tax, with willing submission, and feel themselves subdued. Now this, is, this verse is predicated by saying, fight against those who do not believe in Allah in the last day, and do not forbid what he has forbidden. So clearly the problem with the people who are being fought is not that they are fighting the Muslims. There's no mention made of that. Now there are many other exegetes who might say, oh well that was the circumstances, but actually the generally understood view is that this whole passage of chapter nine was revealed after Muhammad's uh, expedition to Tabuk in Northern Arabia, when he went up to fight against the Byzantines and found that the Byzantines had left. But the Byzantines had not attacked the Muslims. He had just went up there to fight them and exhorted the Muslims to fight solely on the basis of the fact that these people did not obey Allah and his messenger and did not forbid what he had forbidden. So as long as there remain people who do not obey Allah and his messenger and do not forbid what he has forbidden, the command to fight still remains. Obviously, while I'm sure that this view is not held by the gentleman here to my right, at the same time, unfortunately, it is held by all too many Muslims today. And I hope that, above all, that if uh, these gentlemen make the case here to us that uh, Islam uh, should be understood in a peaceful way, that they will devote their efforts within the Muslim community to convincing the Muslims who've been responsible for jihad attacks around the world that they are misunderstanding Islam and need to lay down their arms. Thank you. Thank you. We now ask Saeed Atif to present his panel for 20 minutes. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وآله الطاهرين صل على محمد وآل محمد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته 
My beloved brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, respected clergy, both on the panel and in the audience, and our respected guests who have graciously accepted our invitation to come and have this discussion with us. We thank you very much, and especially we thank um, the organizers of Berean Presbyterian Church for allowing us to have this discussion here today. Our debate question is, does the Quran promote peace? Peace doesn't mean that we agree with each other on everything. An environment of peace is an environment that does not have oppression, persecution, or conflict. Peace means that we live our lives and we let other people live their lives as well. As the Quran says in chapter 109, verse number 6, as David Wood said so eloquently, for you is your religion and for me is my religion. Also chapter 7 verse 180 says, And Allah's are the best names, therefore call on him thereby, and leave alone those who violate the sanctity of his names, they shall be recompensed for what they did. So naturally our debate question should be answered with reasoning and with evidence. As the Quran says in chapter 2 verse 111, it says, Say, bring your proof if you are truthful. Now the Qur'an is a single book, it is not a collection of books, it's not an anthology, it's not a collection of short stories, it is a single book so we should not cherry pick its verses. The Qur'an says in chapter 2 verse 85, do you then believe in a part of the book and disbelieve in the, in the other? One part of the Qur'an explains another part of the Qur'an. We also cannot overlook the meanings of words or phrases. Translations into languages other than Arabic are sufficient for understanding the basics of Islam and for a person to be a good Muslim. But an expert on the Qur'an must have a minimum understanding of the language of the Qur'an. And what Muslims believe, what Muslims say or they do is not evidence. Whatever contradicts the Qur'an is not evidence in our debate. And we cannot interpret the Qur'an according to our own biases or our own limitations. We must allow the Qur'an to speak for itself. And also we may use hadith as evidence. Hadith are accounts of what people saw or heard from Prophet Muhammad. Hadith also includes the words and actions of the 12 successors from his family. So we have Prophet Muhammad saying in a widely accepted narration, he says, I'm leaving among you two weighty and important things. The one being the book of Allah and the second are the people of my house. So after Prophet Muhammad died, the general Muslim community they did not follow his family and the authority was taken by others that the Prophet had not endorsed. So some of these rulers after Prophet Muhammad, they sent the Muslim armies into foreign lands. And to gain public support for their military adventures, they enlisted influential figures to start fabricating hadith. So we have Prophet Muhammad saying, O people, many lies have spread around and they are considered to be my hadith. Whoever forges lies and calls them my sayings has filled up his seat with fire. And Imam Ali, the first successor, said after the Holy Prophet, there were more such lies. So some fabricated hadith made it a sin to rebel against tyrants. This worked out very good for a tyrant. Or so others encouraged spreading Islam through offensive war. And this works for a person who wants to spread his empire. Now Prophet Muhammad has said that if a hadith agrees with the Qur'an, you should accept it. But if it contradicts the Qur'an, then you reject it. So the Qur'an presents Prophet Muhammad as a warner, as a reminder, as a guide, as a mercy to the world, but never introduces him as one who brings war. Prophet Muhammad has said that God has said, Woe upon those who treacherously use religion for their worldly goals and fight those who command people to yield to justice. Woe upon those among whom the believers live frightened and hide their belief. This saying perfectly demonstrates what ISIS does today. Or he said, Allah has cursed the one who kills someone other than the one who tries to kill him or strikes against someone other than the one who tries to strike him. And he said, a believer spending days and nights with suffering from the losses of his loved ones is better than his spending days and nights in the state of war. We seek protection from Allah against war. A man asked the sixth Imam, as we believe there are 12 Imams after Prophet Muhammad, asked the sixth Imam, I mobilized and faced the disbelievers. Should I fight them before calling them to Allah? And the Imam said, if they mobilize and fight, then you were drawn into it. But if they are people who have not mobilized and had not fought, you can do nothing but invite them to Allah. A man in another narration had acquired a sword and a horse and people asked the eighth Imam, what that man should do. And the Imam said, he should serve as a guard, but he must not fight. The people then asked, 
do you say that if the Romans entered the land of the Muslims, they should not stop them? And the Imam answered, it, it, their duty is to be on their guard but not fighting. However, if the center of Islam, the center of the Muslim nation and Muslims are in danger, then one must fight. After Prophet Muhammad, one ideology supported self-defense, which is the message of the 12 Imams, who the Prophet endorsed and commanded the Muslims to follow, and another group fabricated hadith and narrations to justify their militarism, such as we have today with the Wahhabi ideology, which is the ideology of ISIS and Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. So these terrorist groups, they all follow this ideology, and this doctrine goes all the way back to those tyrants who were fabricating and making up hadith after the Prophet. Imam Hussein was the third Imam after Prophet Muhammad and he was the grandson of the Prophet. And in his time he led an uprising against a tyrant named Yazid. Imam Hussein he said, Verily, I have not risen up because of provocation, nor arrogance, nor to cause chaos, nor as an oppressor, and verily I have come out seeking the reformation of the nation of my grandfather Muhammad. Meaning that after Prophet Muhammad the nation had gone away from his teachings, and now the one that the Prophet had established and endorsed and commanded the Muslims to follow, he must reform that nation, that religion, back to what the Prophet had taught. So, Imam Hussein and 72 of his supporters, they stood against the Yazid's army of 30,000. And on that day, they became martyrs, even as they called the enemy to abandon tyranny. And this epic of Karbala is the true meaning of jihad, which means standing against tyranny and oppression. Imam Hussein also said, O people, the Prophet of Allah said, whoever sees a tyrant king acting towards the servant of God with sin and tyranny, then if he does not act against that king through practice or speech, it is Allah's right to make him enter into the tyrant's place of entry, meaning the hellfire. So after Prophet Muhammad, there were certain dynasties that fought each other for power, and the 12 Imams were a thorn in their side because they spoke against tyranny and against oppression. This continues today as the followers of the 12 Imams. They fight against the Wahhabi ideologies of ISIS and Al-Qaeda. And terrorists like ISIS, they hate the Shia, they hate the followers of the 12th Imam because of their call to follow these 12 Imams. And the Shias are the primary targets of these terrorists and the Shias and the Sunnis. Even today, they're on the front lines fighting and dying against ISIS. Every year, more than 20 million people, Shias, Sunnis, Christians, Hindus, people from other religions, they gather in Karbala to commemorate the sacrifice of Imam Hussein and to show their opposition to terrorist groups like ISIS. And this is the message of the 12 Imams who taught what is consistent with the Quran and what is consistent with the tradition of Prophet Muhammad. But we do not accept the Hadith just because it is attributed to the 12 Imams. The Quran is from God, therefore it is infallible and perfect, but the Hadith are transmitted to us through people. Therefore, a Hadith cannot be evidence in this debate if it contradicts the Quran. So with this standard, the answer is a definite and absolute yes, that the Qur'an promotes peace through justice. One major aspect of peace is not to be forced into any belief. So the Qur'an says, chapter 28, verse 56, Verily, you cannot guide whom you love, but Allah guides whom He pleases. Will you then force men until they become believers? And it is not for a soul to believe except by Allah's permission. Or Allah says, Call to the way of your Lord with wisdom and goodly exhortation and have disputations with them in the best manner. Verily your Lord best knows those who go astray from his path and he knows best those who follow the right way. And he says, for you is your religion, for me is my religion. And also there is no compulsion in religion. Or Allah also says that he alone is the one who judges people's place in the afterlife. Chapter 2 verse 62 says, Verily, those who believe and those who are Jews and the Christians and the Sabians, whoever believes in Allah and the last day and does good, they shall have their reward from their Lord and there is no fear for them nor shall they grieve. The Quran says that there is no superiority between one race of, over another race. The Quran says, O mankind, verily, we have created you from a male and a female and made you tribes and families that you may know each other. Verily, the most honorable of you with Allah is your most pious. And Allah says that you should make peace between men even if you swear by God's name that you will not. He says, and because of your swearing by Him, do not make Allah an obstacle to your righteousness and piety in making peace between men. And He says, and Allah invites to the abode of peace and guides whom He pleases into the right path. So the Quran's default position is peace and relations between people are predicated on peace. As the Quran says, it may be that Allah will bring about friendship between you and those whom you hold to be your enemies among them. And Allah is powerful and Allah is forgi for forgiving and merciful. 
Allah does not forbid you respecting those who have not made war against you on account of your religion and have not driven you forth from your homes that you show them kindness and deal with them just, justly. Verily, Allah loves the doers of justice. Allah only forbids you respecting those who made war upon you on account of your religion and drove you forth from your homes and backed up others in your expulsion that you take them as guardians. Whoever takes them as guardians, these are the unjust. So the Quran mentioned fighting when the Muslims had to defend themselves as our guest panel so eloquently said as the Quran says permission to fight is given to those upon whom war is made because they are oppressed and the good and the evil are not alike so repel evil with what is best so then he between whom and you was enmity would be as if he were a warm friend so the Quran's formula for fighting is very simple defend yourselves if you're attacked observe the limits of just warfare fight the enemy wherever they may be if the enemy withdraws, then there is no, no more fighting. If someone seeks protection from you from the enemy, grant it. If the enemy calls for peace, God is forgiving. And hostility is against oppressors and aggressors, never against non-combatants. We shall see an example of this in the next passage from the Quran, where Allah says, and fight in the way of Allah with those who fight with you. And do not exceed the limits. Verily, Allah does not love those who exceed the limits. And kill them wherever you find them. Thankfully, some of those who criticize Islam for being violent, they no longer quote this passage as one being violent because they have been called out for misquoting and cherry picking this verse that says, and kill them wherever you find them. Thankfully, our panel, guest panel, has quoted this as one of the verses of peace. Further says, and drive them out from where they drove you out, and persecution is severer than slaughter. And do not fight with them at the sacred mosque until they fight with you in it. But if they do fight you, then slay them. Such is the recompense of the disbelievers. But if they desist, then verily Allah is forgiving, merciful. And fight with them until there is no persecution and religion should be for Allah, meaning that those who attack you are trying to stop you from practicing your religion until your religion is restored. But if they desist, then there should be no hostility except against the oppressors. Now, if the Quran wants a total domination, according to the doctrine of stealth jihad or the three stages of the jihad that our guest panel explained, if the Quran wants a total domination, it would have commanded the Muslims to keep on fighting. Some may say that the Muslims were not strong enough to overpower their enemy. But an enemy that stops fighting, an enemy that calls for peace, does so because they have been overpowered. And in the Quran, whenever the enemy stops fighting or calls for peace, the Muslims are commanded to accept peace. The Quran never commands the Muslims to reject peace or to continue fighting when the enemy stops. The Quran says in chapter 9, verses 3 to 13, and this is what some people ominously call the verse of the sword. The passage says, and announce a painful punishment to those who disbelieve. Except those of the polytheists with whom you made an agreement, then they have not failed you in anything and have not backed up anyone against you. So fulfill their agreement to the end of their term. Verily, Allah loves the, who are, those who are careful of their duty. So there was a peace treaty between the polytheists of Mecca and the Muslims. And the polytheists of Mecca violently broke that treaty by killing some of the Muslims. It continues. So when the sacred months have passed, then slay the polytheists wherever you find them and take them captives and besiege them and lie and wait for them in every ambush. Every one of these is an example of a tactic of warfare that every nation uses. This is standard tactics of war. Then it says, then if they repent and keep up prayer and pay the poor rate, leave their way free to them. Verily, Allah is forgiving and merciful. So those who join the Muslims are forgiven. And if one of the polytheists seeks protection from you, grant him protection until he, until he hears the word of Allah, not that he becomes forced to convert until he hears the word, then make him attain his place of safety. This is because there are people who do not know. How can there be an agreement for the idolaters with Allah and with his messenger except those with whom you made an agreement at the sacred mosque? So as long as they are true to you, be true to them. Verily, Allah loves those who are careful of their duty. So it means keep peace with those he keep who keep peace with you. It continues. How can it be while well, if they prevail against you, they would not pay regard in your case the ties of relationship nor those of covenant. They please you with their mouths while their hearts do not consent and most of them are transgressors. They have taken a small price for Allah's communications so they turn away from His way. Verily evil is it that they do. They do not pay regard to ties of relationship nor those of covenant in the case of a believer and these are they who go beyond the limits. But if they repent and keep up prayer and they pay the poor rate, they are your brethren in faith and we make the communications clear for a people who know. And if they break their oaths after their agreement and openly revile your religion, then fight the leaders of disbelief. Verily, their oaths are nothing so that they may desist. It emphasizes that fighting is only against those who have violated the treaty. And the next verse says, So will you not fight a people who broke their oaths 
and aimed at the expulsion of the messenger and they attacked you first. Do you fear them? But Allah is most deserving that you should fear him if you are believers. So this verse, chapter 9, verse 5, which is called the verse of the sword, is used against the Quran, is used against Islam to try to show that it is a violent religion, that it says to go kill people just because they're of a different religion. But the context obviously shows that this is absolutely not the case. Now the Quran says in verse 929, which is another verse that is famously quoted by the anti-Islam movement, it says, fight those who do not believe in Allah, nor in the last day, nor do they prohibit what Allah and his messenger have made sacred, nor follow the religion of truth from those who have been given the book until they pay the tax and acknowledgement of superiority and they are in a state of subjection. So we should make a point here in Islam. There are two categories of things that are forbidden. Some things are forbidden like pork and other things are what we call sacred like human life. So if I am starving, I can eat pork to save my life. But if I'm starving and someone won't give me his food, I cannot kill that person to take his food. This is the difference between what is forbidden and what is sacred. And this verse is talking about those things that are sacred. The terminology, harram Allah, wa ma yuharrimuna harram Allah. This terminology, harram Allah, is only used in the Quran to refer to things that God has made sacred by attaching the holy name of Allah to the prohibition God emphasizes its sanctity. Verse 937 also mentions this terminology Haram Allah to refer to the sanctity of the sacred months in which killing and fighting are forbidden. And there are three other places where this terminology Haram Allah is used. And there are the last three verses mentioned here which have almost exactly the same wording. And do not kill the soul that Allah has forbidden Haram Allah. Allah has forbidden that life to be killed except in the requirements of justice and all three have exactly the same wording. If this referred to all forbidden things, as our guest panel have said, that Muslims are fighting these non-believers just because they are non-believers, then the Prophet himself would have fought all of the Jews and Christians who were near him, but he did not. This did not happen. Verse 929 refers to the sanctity of human life. It calls for retaliation against those who commonly take human life, like terrorists, those who do not respect the sanctity of life. And the verse is not referring to all Jews and Christians. It's not referring to all Jewish and Christian communities, but they, because it clarifies it by the word min, which means from. So you'll see whenever the Quran mentions disbelievers and people of the book, meaning Jews and Christians in the same sentence, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا مِنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ Verily the disbelievers from the people of the book, not all of the people of the book. So only those communities who violate the sanctity of human life, they are the ones to be fought. And after their defeat, they are not released to go out and continue what they're doing without consequence, but they fall under the guardianship of the Muslims. Under the guardianship of the Muslims, their rights and their duties will be exactly the same as the Muslims, except that they pay a tax called the jizya, but they do not pay the zakat and the khums that the Muslims pay, and they are not required to perform military service. So verse 929, does not abrogate previous verses but falls completely in harmony with them. The violent verses in the Quran do not abrogate the peaceful verses because violent verses do not exist in the Quran. A violent verse would say, you used to fight in self-defense, but now you must attack first. But no such verse exists in the Quran. An abrogation does not change what is sacred and does not change what is forbidden absolutely. Human life is sacred and killing an innocent person is always forbidden. A life can only be taken in retaliation for murder or terrorism. As the Quran says, for this reason did we prescribe to the children of Israel that whoever kills a soul, unless it be for manslaughter or for mischief in the land, it is as though he killed all men. Whoever keeps it alive, it is as though he kept alive all men. So it becomes very clear that these two verses, which are two of the strongest verses, or probably the strongest verses, that the anti-Islam movement uses to try to show that the Quran is a violent book absolutely has nothing to do with aggressive warfare or offensive violence. It is defensive. It is protecting the oppressed. Does the Quran promote peace? The only answer supported by reasoning and evidence is yes, the Quran promotes peace through justice. And this is emphasized by the verse that our guest panelist, our respected Robert Spencer, just read for it. As an example of the Quran being violent, he quoted 839. He said, fight with them until the religion should only be for Allah. But the verse says, and fight with them until there's no more persecution. And religion should only be for Allah. But if they stop fighting, then surely Allah sees what they do. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.
Thank you. We will now ask our guest panel to give their rebuttal for 10 minutes. Let me start with that last verse mentioned. Chapter 5, verse 32 of the Quran. Just to give you an example of what I'm referring to. Because of that, we ordained for the children of Israel that if anyone killed a person not in retaliation of murder or to spread mischief in the land, it would be as if he killed all mankind. Notice that this is command for the children of Israel. It's actually a quotation from the Talmud. But what's not in the Talmud is that qualification, except if they spread mischief in the land. Now, what does that include? Because you're not supposed to kill someone unless they murder someone or spread mischief in the land. What inclu what, what's, what's included in that spreading mischief? Well, it's used in the Quran in a bunch of ways, and according to Muslim scholars like Ibn Kathir, it even includes unbelief. So that's, the, as far as I can tell, the most peaceful verse in the Quran, and that's allowing a lot, but it's saying that this is for the children of Israel. The very next verse is directed towards Muslims, and the very next verse right after this says, the recompense of those who wage war against Allah and his messenger and do mischief in the land, once again, you're doing some sort of mischief in the land, is only that they shall be killed or crucified or their hands and their feet be cut off from opposite sides or be exiled from the land. That is their disgrace in this world and a great torment is theirs in the hereafter. So, when Allah tells you about the value of a human life, he can't go one verse without calling for killing, crucifixion, and dismembering people, all for the vague crime of spreading mischief in the land. What does that mean? Well, it seems like it could mean all kinds of things. Anything you find in some Muslim source about what, inc what involves mischief, well, now you have justification for killing or dismembering them and crucifying them. So, very interesting how when we talk about the context of the Quran, and we talk about something like Surah 5, verse 32, it does help to read the actual context. Now, we had a very interesting interpretation of Surah 2, verse 85. Do you believe in part of the book and disbelieve in the other? Why do I say this is an interesting in interpretation? Well, chapter 2, verse 85 is directed towards the Jews. The whole passage is talking to the, talking to the Jews. And this passage is talking about the Jews violating the Torah, and the response is, do you just believe in part of the book and not in another? So if we're talking about context, this is talking to Jews, not to Muslims on how to interpret the Quran. Second, it doesn't say, do you follow every part of the book equally? It says, do you believe in only part of the book? We're not talking about not believing in parts of the Quran. As a Muslim, you would believe in all of the Quran. But that doesn't mean that all of them are equally, apply equally at all times. If, if, if you are saying that, that would go against 14 centuries worth of uh, interpreting the Quran, Sunni and Shia. Um, now, we heard an interesting interpretation of the Hadith, which I would agree with. If Hadith contradicts the Quran, it must be rejected. So if, now that would go both ways, by the way. If we find something peaceful in the Hadith that contradicts something that Allah clearly says in the Quran, then we would have to uh, question, that in, question that Hadith on those grounds. Um, we had a quotation from chapter 60, verse 8 of the Quran, which you're not prevented from showing kindness if one of your family members who's a pagan happens to come to you. That's the historical context. You're allowed to uh, show kindness. And, but the idea was that uh, that might help them convert to Islam. We have records of Muhammad giving gold to people over and over again until they would love him so much that they would convert. But if we're talking about context, we can't ignore the fact that just four verses earlier, we have the story of Abraham, and Abraham says to the unbelievers, now there is endless hostility between us, and we can't end the hostility until you convert to Islam. So here we have, here we have a peaceful verse of the Quran. This shows that the Quran is peace. And just a few verses earlier, in the same context, we have Abraham saying, there can't be peace between us until you convert to Islam. And the exact same verse, chapter 60, verse 4, look it up, says that Abraham is an example for the Muslims. So, if, over and over again, any peaceful passage of the Quran that we turn to, we find something that really seems to contradict it, 
it's very easy to say, well, the peaceful part that I really like here, that's the part that applies. This other violent part, it can't mean what it sounds like it means. I have to assume that Allah means uh, the peaceful part. My view is that Allah meant them all, right? If, if he's talking about showing peace towards someone in certain circumstances, Allah means that. If he says, fight those who do not believe in Allah, he means that as well. The only way to reconcile these passages is as an unfolding revelation that was impacted by the situation that Muslims were in. Because Muslims were in different situations during the time of Muhammad and different, situa different rulings are going to apply. This doesn't change the fact that the final marching orders have nothing to do, and you can read the past chapter, matter of fact, maybe we'll read it later, chapter 9, verse 28 through chapter 9, verse 23, that's the passage talking about dealing with Jews and Christians. There is not one word in that passage about anyone doing anything other than believing the wrong thing or practicing the wrong religious belief. Not one word about fighting. And to expand on this, Robert Spencer. Thank you, David. Our uh, esteemed colleague, my friend here, uh, was very right in warning about fabricated hadith. And he quoted quite a few hadith. Uh, actually, I happen to have the source that he was using for the hadith that he quoted, the uh, hadith collection Al-Kafi, and uh, it is generally considered to be reliable among Shiite Muslims. And in it, it says, this is one of the passages he did not quote, uh, that Muhammad is quoted as saying, mobilize in the name of Allah and in the way of Allah. Fight those who reject belief in Allah. Fight those who reject belief in Allah. He doesn't say fight those who reject belief in Allah if they fight you or if they attack you, but simply because they reject belief in Allah. This is underscored by the fact that he goes on to say, when you meet these people, you give them three choices. Call them to al-Islam. So in the first place, you are addressing the fact that they are not believers. You are not asking them to lay down their arms or dealing with them in any kind of context of war previous to that. You're calling them to Islam. If they reject that, then you ask them to pay the tax, the jizya, which was explained very ably, except for the fact that the other part of the passage, nine, chapter 9, verse 29, says, with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. And the non-believers who have been under this agreement in Islamic lands have always lived in a state of subservience, denied basic rights, having to submit to various humiliating and discriminatory regulations that made sure that they felt themselves subdued. Also, uh, when we are dealing with these kinds of issues, it is important to evoke authorities that are generally respected among Muslims who delineate the understanding of these passages for Muslims. After all, no Muslim is believing what Spencer thinks about Islam, nor should any Muslim. But if you were a Shiite, then of course, the Ayatollah Khomeini is a highly respected figure somebody who devoted his life to understanding Islam properly, somebody who was revered in the Islamic Republic of Iran and worldwide among Shia for his knowledge of Islam. And he, of course, said this, those who know nothing of Islam pretends that Islam counsels against war. Those who say this are witless. Islam says, kill all the unbelievers just as they would kill you all. Does this mean that Muslims should sit back until they are devoured? Islam says, kill them, put them to the sword, and scatter their armies. Does this mean sitting back until non-Muslims overcome us? Islam says, kill in the service of Allah those who may want to kill you. Does this mean that we should surrender? Islam says, whatever good there is exists thanks to the sword and in the shadow of the sword. People cannot be made obedient except with the sword. The sword is the key to paradise, which can be opened only for the holy warriors. There are hundreds of Quranic Psalms and Hadiths teaching Muslims to value war and to fight. Does all this mean that Islam is a religion that prevents men from waging war? I spit upon those foolish souls who make such a claim. Thus the Ayatollah Khomeini. And finally, Muhammad himself also in the Hadith of Al-Kafi, the very first passage that he is in this book, this section on jihad, he says, the Messenger of Allah has said, all good things are with the sword, under the shadow of the sword, and people cannot be improved without the sword. Swords are the key to paradise or hellfire. 
That is not peace. Thank you. Thank you. And now Saeed Atif will give a 10-minute rebuttal for his panel. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. We thank our guest. Okay, sorry. Can everyone hear me? If anyone can hear me, please cannot hear me. Okay. So we thank our panel for quoting a verse for us in support of our argument. So we quoted verse five, verse thirty-two of chapter five, which says that if you kill one person, it's the same as you killed all people. And then they say, well, the next verse says otherwise, but first says, and he read the verse, and he just glossed over the first few words of the verse that completely explain that the fighting is only allowed because of war that is made upon you. It says, the punishment of those who wage war against Allah and against His Messenger. What do you do with someone who wages war against you? Do you sit back and you ask them to please stop, or do you have to defend yourself and act justice upon them until there's no more persecution? So we thank our guests for that. And it's a strike and a miss for every single verse that the anti-Islam movement tries to cite as evidence for the Qur'an being violent. It has never been proven that any of the verses are violent except by cherry-picking or interpreting in a way other than how the Prophet has said to interpret the verses. And cherry-picking hadith does not work either. Because if the hadith contradicts the Qur'an, then we don't accept it. That's plain and simple. We never said that the hadith collections are 100% correct. We say that they contain correct hadith, authentic hadith and fabricated hadith. So thank you for reciting for us a hadith that we do not accept. So the methodology of the anti-Islam movement has a number of steps. Number one is to cherry pick verses to present the Quran as violent, like verse 489. If you were to read the entire context of that verse, you would see it has nothing to do with offensive warfare. When the context is shown, context is shown to be peaceful, you just jump to another verse. When there are no more verses left to cherry pick, they say that violent verses abrogated the peaceful ones. When it's shown that violent verses do not exist, well, let me go and cite a violent hadith. When the hadith is shown to contradict the Qur'an, then they go and cite a scholar whose opinion agrees with them. When the opinion is shown to be inconsistent with the Qur'an, or that it is not really saying what they say it says, then they cite Muslim rulers who invaded non-Muslim countries. When it's shown that these rulers acted against the Qur'an, then they try to link the Qur'an to Muslim terrorists. When it's shown that terrorists violate the Qur'an's teachings, they link the Qur'an to policies of Muslim-majority countries. When it's shown that those countries do not operate according to the Qur'an, they attribute cultural practices to Islam. When it's shown that culture is not a source of Islamic teaching, they proclaim disbelief and shock at how so many Muslims could misunderstand the Qur'an. When it's shown that their disbelief is irrelevant because saying, oh my God, does not count as evidence, they claim that Muslims are lying through the doctrine of taqiyya. When it is shown that taqiyya does not apply, they cherry pick a verse and start this cycle all over again. So the anti-Islam movement associates the Quran with what they call stealth jihad. And one of our guest respected guest panelists, Robert Spencer, has a website called jihadwatch.org. I encourage all the brothers and sisters to go and read his material and see his videos. And you will see where things are cherry-picked and misinterpreted. So the first thing says, the first step of this stealth jihad is to call for peace when the Muslims are weak. The second is to defend yourself when you're capable of defending yourself. And the third is to spread Islam by violence when the Muslims are strong. So stealth jihad only works if the Qur'an allows aggression. But as we have seen from every verse that we have quoted and that they have quoted, we have shown that the context completely and utterly shows otherwise, either the context shows otherwise or the meaning of the verse that they don't interpret properly because either they haven't read the proper interpretation or they don't understand the Arabic well enough, it shows that it is not dealing with attacking people offensively. So since the Quran doesn't allow stealth jihad, then the very idea of stealth jihad is anti-Quran. And they also rely on the concept of abrogation, which means to repeal or cancel. They say, they say that violent verses came after the peaceful verses, so the violent verses abrogated the peaceful ones. But for this to work, the violent verses must exist in the first place. Since the Qur'an 
only allow self-defense. There's no abrogation of peaceful verses. So stealth jihad or this three-step process of jihad has no place whatsoever in the Quran. Even when the Muslims are called to self-defense, the Muslims must not cross the boundaries of ethical warfare as we explained earlier in verse 2, one, verse, chapter 2, verse 190, and fight in the way of Allah with those who fight with you and do not exceed the limits. So Ayatollah Sistani, who is one of the highest ranking scholars in the world of Shia Islam, he expanded on these limits in an address that he made to Iraqi soldiers fighting against ISIS. You know ISIS, the murderers and the terrorists and the rapists and the pillagers who kidnap people and take uh, slave girls and do horrible and horrific things when the Muslims went to fight against them. These are the instructions from Ayatollah Sistani. He says, God has called for jihad and has privileged the warriors. It is necessary then to learn these conditions and etiquettes of jihad thoroughly. Do not indulge in acts of extremism. Do not disrespect dead corpses. Do not resort to deceit. Do not kill an elder, a child, or a woman. Be attentive to the sanctity of the human souls. Be attentive to the sanctity of the lives of those who do, who do not fight, such as the weak, the children, the women, even from families of those who fight with you. Do not accuse others of blasphemy which could then lead to their death. Never inflict harm on non-Muslims regardless of their religion and sect. The Muslim must protect his non-Muslim neighbors in the same manner and vigor as he would when he protects his own family. Do not steal the money of others. Do not disrespect the courts of the dead. Do not violate the sanctity of their women and houses. Do not enter their homes. Do not verbally abuse their women. Do not insult their honor, even if your enemies abuse your women and insult your honor. Do not deprive any people who do not fight you of their rights. Know that most of those who fight you are victims who have been led astray by others. Let your righteous actions, your just conduct, and your sound admonition serve as an example for them. Do not resort to oppression. It may be the case that when you adhere to good conduct and discipline, you suffer losses. Nevertheless, this is more spiritually rewarding. Show compassion towards them like you do with your own. Remember God at all times, and remember that one day you will stand before Him. Strive to act in the same righteous manner as the Prophet and his descendants in times of war and peace. Do not perform an action that will be the cause of your spiritual destruction. Unite, come together, and overlook your differences. Everyone must let go of sentiments which carry hatred and bigotry. So they also quote what is called taqiyya. Taqiyya, as we said, means hiding one's faith to avoid death, injury, or property, or loss of property. They say that Muslims claim to be peaceful, but they're hiding their true plan to overpower you. Taqiyya is in the Quran, and every reasonable person would agree that lying to protect your life and to protect yourself against oppression is morally justified. The Quran says, he who disbelieves in Allah after his having believed, not he who was compelled while his heart is at rest on account of faith, but he who opens his heart to disbelief on these is the wrath of Allah. So this verse was revealed about one of Prophet Muhammad's companions, Ammar ibn Yasir. The polytheists of Mecca captured Ammar and his parents and told them to reject Islam. Ammar's parents refused to reject Islam, so they were executed. But Ammar rejected Islam to save his life while his faith was pure at his heart. There is a narration about the period when the Shias were under persecution, as they are today in many countries. The narration says, Once I said to Abu Jafar, one of the 12 Imams, two of the people of Kufa were arrested, and it was said to them, Denounce and reject Ali, who was the first Imam. One of them rejected, and the other one did not reject. The one who rejected Imam Ali was released, and the one who did not reject him was killed. The Imam said, the one who denounced and rejected Ali was an expert of the Allah of his religion, and the one who did not denounce was in a hurry to go to paradise. Meaning that he understood that protect his life is more important than verbally saying something that is against your faith, because the faith is pure in his heart. Another verse about taqiyya, which is quoted by Muslim Critics or critics, critics of Islam is chapter 3 verse 28. Let not the believers take the disbelievers for guardians rather than believers. And whoever does this, he shall have nothing of the guardianship of Allah except that you are guard against them, guarding carefully. So it means that Muslims should not take disbelievers as their religious authorities. Just like the non-believers would not take the Muslims as their religious authorities. Except to protect yourselves from harm, which makes absolute sense. If you have to say something, you have to profess something to protect your life, to protect yourself from injury, to protect your family, this is reasonable. And the word awliya in this verse means masters or guardians in religion, as the Quran says in chapter 5, verse 55. Verily, your wali, your master, is Allah, his messenger, and those who believe, 
those who keep up prayers and pay the poor rate while they bow. So the anti-Islam movement cites taqiyya to brand Muslims as liars, but there's absolutely no basis for this or any of their other arguments in the Quran. Assalamu alaikum. We thank both panels for their presentations. We will now have a 20 minute break followed by a question and answer session. We recommend that the audience use this time to prepare questions for either panel. No cards and pens will be distributed. Please indicate which panel your question is, uh, yeah, which, your, which panel your question is for and please be concise and questions should be related only to today's topic. Return your question cards to any of the volunteers circulating around and we will reconvene in 20 minutes so, and, and we ask all audience members to be in their seats so that we can begin promptly. Thank you. Okay, we're going to get started with the question and answer session now. Um, panelists will have three minutes to answer each question. We will alternate each questions with each panel. And once one side is finished answering a question, the other side will have a chance to answer the question as well with three minutes. Um, I will indicate when there are 15 seconds left for an answer. And we ask that there be no applause during the question and answer so we can get through as many questions as possible before we have to start closing statements. So for the first question is for our guest panelists. And it says, if the majority of Muslims are nonviolent and one splinter group, i.e. ISIS or Al-Qaeda, can't, uh, and yeah, can't only the logical conclusion be that the minority is in the wrong with the skewed interpretation of the Quran? Uh, well, I as far as Islam is concerned, and this would be the same with anything else, um, it wouldn't matter if every Muslim in the world were the most peaceful person in the world. That would not change what Allah and Muhammad said 1,400 years ago. Or if every Muslim in the world were a terrorist, that would not change what Allah and Muhammad said 14 centuries ago. So Islam is defined by Allah and Muhammad in the Quran and the Hadith. Um, it's not determined by majority vote today. If I said, well, uh, lots of Christians are mean, so Jesus didn't teach, love your enemies. What, do you, it, what Christians do has no impact on what Jesus did. They're not building time machines and going back and changing the teachings. And so for, if we're talking about what Islam teaches, um, then we don't look to what, what Muslims are doing, although it's certainly relevant and might spur our interest to go and look at what Islam teaches. Uh, but I, I do object to the claim that it's only one tiny little splinter group. Uh, did you want to comment on that, Robert? Yeah, actually, uh, there's ISIS, there's Al-Qaeda, there's Boko Haram, there's Abu Sayyaf, there is Jamaat Islami, there is Hezbollah and Hamas. There are armed jihad groups all over the world on every inhabited continent. And they all point to the Quran and the teachings of Muhammad to justify what they do. Uh, one question we would have if, is if this understanding of Islam represented by what we've heard today from the other side is the correct one, then why is it that so many Muslims don't get it? 30,000 Muslims from around the world believed in ISIS enough to go from their countries, from 100 different countries around the world to join ISIS in Iraq and Syria. Why is it that they were not taught properly? Why is it that they're in their local mosques and from their parents who were Muslims, they didn't learn the true peaceful Islam? Why is it that Islam has failed so spectacularly to communicate this message of peace to so many tens of thousands of thousands of Muslims worldwide? Why is it that all these people who misunderstand Islam misunderstand it in the same exact way? as to think that it mandates warfare against unbelievers and that you can find Muslims waging war against unbelievers throughout the history of Islam. These are questions that actually show that the idea that Islam teaches peace is based on a very weak read that has no foundation in Islamic tradition. Or otherwise we would see large scale movements not just not joining ISIS but actively fighting against it. And yet Muslims against ISIS groups and demonstrations have always gotten like 25 or 50 people. Whereas uh, demonstrations against cartoons of Muhammad or things like that get tens of thousands. So as we said in our rebuttal, disbelief 
and shock is not evidence. So I can't say, oh my God, I can't believe why so many Muslims misunderstand it. This is not evidence. My shock and disbelief at why so many Muslims misunderstand the message of the Quran, that shock and disbelief is not evidence in itself. And as David Wood very eloquently said, even if all of the Muslims of the world were peaceful, if the Quran was teaching a message of violence, then all of those Muslims being peaceful does not make the Quran peaceful. But in the same way, if a majority of the Muslims, even if all of the Muslims were violent, it would not make the Quran violent. The religion is separate by itself in one side, and the people and what they do is completely something else on the other side, and this goes for any religion. What Christians and, or Muslims or people of any religion have done in the past is not a reflection of the religion itself. The religion is completely separate. So we do not say that just because the majority or, or a minority of a people do something that that is what determines what the scripture teaches. No. Truth is not determined by the majority. Truth stands by itself no matter how many people believe it. So as we said, there is absolutely no verses of violence whatsoever in the Quran. And all of the verses that they have constantly been quoting. For example, one of the verses that is famously quoted as being a verse of violence is chapter 4, chapter four verse 89 which says they desire that you should disbelieve as they have disbelieved so that you may all be alike therefore take not from them guardians until they fly in, in Allah's way but if they turn back then seize them and kill them wherever you find them so they quote this verse they cherry pick it but they do not read the verses before which say and what reason do you have that you should not fight in the way of Allah and of the weak among the men and the women and the children, those who cry out and say, Our Lord, cause us to go forth from this town whose people are oppressors and give us from yourself a guardian and give us from yourself a helper. So the first verse says there's people being oppressed and they're crying to you for help. Why don't you go and help them? Then the verse says go and fight them. And then the verses afterwards, just as the passages before, they qualify and they limit. It says do not cross the limits. If they ask for peace, you respect that. But if they do not ask for peace, then you fight for justice. 40 seconds. With the due respect of all of you, especially David Wood and Robert Johnson, my humble request is, Quran is in Arabic and each and every word of Arabic might have 70 meanings. So this is very important to learn. Hebrews, Hebrews words, they do not have 70 meanings. The Bible was revealed in Hebrew and now it is in English. There are a lot of misconceptions about Quran and we should remove that and we cannot judge from the individual's theology of a religion. If all of the people are going to be against law, it doesn't mean the constitution of USA is wrong. Thank you. The next question we have is for the Muslim panel. Can you offer a coherent Quranic understanding of what it means for someone to perform mischief as mentioned in the Quran ayah? As I said earlier, fasad doesn't mean only the difference. Fasad doesn't mean the difference of opinion. That has a word, ikhtilaf. Fasad means to create something wrong which causes the terrorism, which causes the terrorism. وَقَاتِلُوهُمْ حَتَّى لَا تَكُونَ fitna. Fitna al fitna to akbaru min al qatl. Even Quran says this mischief is worse than killing. If terror is going to be promoted, so every government and every religion follower will be against those terrorists. This is not against the difference of opinion. So just to quickly clarify the words that he was using, fasad, in the verse that is uh, quoted so oftenly by saying there's a there is a phrase which is used in many verses of the Quran which says, and those who make mischief in the land, وَيُفْسِدُونَ فِي الْأَرْضِ They make mischief in the land. What he was explaining is that this mischief does not mean the difference of religion, but it means fitna, which is, uh, means persecution. And the Quran says that persecution is worse than slaughter. Because if I, God forbid, were to kill someone, that's one person being killed. But if I establish persecution, that means that's murder 
and massacres become widespread among the entire society. This is why persecution is worse than slaughter, and that mischief that is being talked about means persecution. Now our guest panel will have a chance to answer. Uh, yes. Um, first, on the sort of obvious level, if it meant persecution, again, there, there are perfectly good words for saying persecution. By saying mischief in the land, that leaves the door open for anything you want to say happens to be mischief in the land. And again, don't take this from me. Ibn Kathir says that the phrase can even refer to unbelief in the land. You're just an unbeliever. That's, that's mischief in the land. This is supposed to be a Muslim land. Uh, and Ibn, this is not, I'm not quoting the Al-Qaeda handbook here. I'm quoting the most respected Sunni commentator of all time. And I know, we, you know most of the Muslims here aren't, aren't Sunnis, but still, uh, if the word were just clear, we wouldn't have this problem. If it had been those who oppress you or those who persecute you instead of those who make mischief in the land. And the reason this is relevant is because um, uh, Sayyid Atik earlier quoted Surah 532, uh, then I quoted Surah 533 as a response, and he says, but it talks about making warfare uh, against Allah and Muhammad, but that's, that's the idea. How do you make warfare against Allah? Somewhere else, right? I mean, it's not talking, it's, I mean, you don't march an army against Allah, you, you would do what? Well. There are Muslim commentators who say it includes opposing Sharia, standing in the path of Islam, all sorts of things. And that's my real point. If you want to interpret mischief, uh, you can interpret mischief as whatever, as whatever you want. But by not making any sort of clear term, the door is wide open to say, oh, we get to kill people who make mischief. That Christian over there is making mischief, he just preached the gospel. That Jew over there is making mischief, he didn't, you know, he, he, he ate the wrong thing or something like that. So, um, big problem. Uh, just to support what David is saying, the Islamic Republic of Iran, which of course follows Shia, 12 or Shiite Islam as its official religion, has charged numerous converts from Islam to Christianity with mischief in the land and imprisoned and tortured them as a result. And that's their only crime. Their crime is unbelief. And so it's very clear that the Ayatollahs who are learned in Shiite Islam, who lead the Islamic Republic of Iran, understand mischief in the land as involving unbelief and not simply regarding persecution by unbelievers against the Muslims. Thank you. The next question is aimed toward our guest panel. Um, the question says, for, it's actually for both sides, how is the Quran compiled? Um, how is the the question is, how is the Qur'an compiled? I, I don't know if you meant how it's currently compiled, like sort of apart from the beginning, it's, it's kind of longest to shortest, like compiled like that, or you mean historically. Uh, do, do, do we want to answer this because it's not relevant? Or I mean, hap I'm happy to answer it. I didn't know if you wanted to go sort of to a different topic. Okay. okay. We'll okay. just move on to the next question then. Um, for the Muslim panel, it says, you mentioned that all hadith are not taken by the Shia as authentic. Okay, there's a few questions. Okay, it says, directed to both Mr. Wood and Mr. Spencer, how long have you studied the Quran and have you ever consulted someone from the Islamic community to go over the text? Um, there are lots of, of books out there on Islam. Um, I, I've read almost none of them if they're modern books. That is how I actually started. I was taking a class on Islam um, in, in college. I, had a, I was majoring in philosophy with an emphasis in religious studies, so we had to study Islam and uh, study modern books. Um, it, but I, afterwards, I started studying the Quran and the Hadith, and since then, I've, uh, I've relied almost, almost completely on Islam's most trusted sources, so the Quran, uh, the Hadith, the earliest biography, Ibn Ishaq, um, and the most, the most respected Islamic scholars um, of, of all time. So when, I, when I'm, if I'm telling you that there's something, you know, about Islam that it teaches something, and I'm, I'm quoting scholars, I just want to be clear, this is not us trying to make things up, and it's not us just ignoring what Muslims say. We're saying, here's what the Quran says, Here's what Islam's most trusted sources say about it. Here's what some of Islam's most respected scholars of all time said about it. Therefore, we're telling you. Uh, so, um, I, I mentioned earlier that maybe 15 years of reading the Quran and the Muslim sources, so. I first read the Quran in 1980. I've read it many times since then. I took courses on Islam in uh, graduate school 
from Gordon Newby, the author of the Encyclopedia of Islam, and uh, David Halperin, another scholar of religions. But mostly, I, like David, I read the Quran, I read Bukhari and Muslim, the uh, Sunni Hadith, as well as Ibn Majah Tirmidhi, uh, and the, some of the other major Sunni Hadith, as well as uh, some of the principal Sunni tafsir, the commentaries on the Quran, uh, Ibn Kathir, Tafsir al-Jalalain, Qurtubi, and others have also studied uh, Islamic jurisprudence, uh, particularly the uh, Ulam al-Quran of uh, Ahmad von Denfer, a German convert, and uh, the uh, Umdat as-Salik uh, Sunni Shiite, uh, sorry, the Shafi'i Sfiq uh, from uh, Cairo, from Al-Azhar, and many, many other books uh, trying to represent the uh, majority understanding, the mainstream understanding of what Islam is, and to explain when the jihad terrorists cite Quran and Hadith as they do, and they explain what they're doing on the basis of what the Quran says and what Muhammad says, what exactly is in there, what is in the tradition, and this is what I have uh, in many books been dedicated to revealing and to making clear to people. It's not here again, just as David said, not my opinion, but the opinion of mainstream Islamic scholars, both contemporary and throughout history. Before I enter into <clears throat> this answer, it is uh, very necessary to clarify that the individual's activity doesn't represent theology of the religion. So this is uh, one of the uh, important reasons Muslims are being defamed if there is any terrorism by a Muslim, they say this is Islamic terrorism. And if a Christian does this kind of activity, they say it is Christian, doesn't say Christianity's terrorism. I regret both Christianity and Islam. They do not promote or teach terrorism. And terrorism or peace, they are different schools of thought. Most of the Muslims, including Sunnis, they are not terrorists. They are peaceful and Islam is the religion of peace. Quran is the book of peace. Let me get to this answer. If you want to become a scholar, a clergy in Islam, you have to properly go to the seminary. If I say I am post-doctorate education and I do not have any degree, so I cannot be titled as doctor until I get degree from the university. If someone wants to become a scholar, should study all the Arabic grammar, all logic and philosophy, all ilm e ilm -e maani bayan extra, and then can go into the interpretation of the tafsir. Only studying of the tafsir or studying of the Quran, it doesn't indicate that a person is scholar now. Please, the applause takes up the time of the people as, as, as questions, please. So very quickly in the few seconds that are left, I would just like to say that when we say, why is it that so many Muslims misunderstand the Quran and think it's violent? Well, it's very clear to us. We read it, we read it exactly as it's read, we read it in the context, we don't cherry pick or misinterpret. So why is it that we understand that it's peaceful? Isn't it possible that we have the correct interpretation? And as we said, that the anti-Islam movement, one of the tactics that they use is to try to take the policies of a country that has a Muslim majority and use that to judge the religion or the book by it, when it is not possible to do that. We don't do that with any other country and their religion. We should not do it with Islam and the Quran. Thank you. The next question is, you mentioned that the hadith that are used to interpret the Quran are not taken by the Shia as authentic. What is the process used to determine which hadith is authentic and which is not? Uh, first of all, if hadith is against the education of Quran, Prophet himself told us to reject it. Fazrebuho alal jadar. There is another very important issue that Prophet said it is in the beginning of Muslim Sharif that kasura alayyal wawwaun. There are a lot of people who are spreading fake statements on behalf of me, and in the end of the world they will be even un increased. So I will humbly request all of you, especially those who are seeking and researching Islam, do not go behind any hadith. 
you have to check in ilm ur rijal whether the chain of the quarters chain of the traditioners they are honest or they are not honest so one of the most basic criteria for the hadith being correct is the one that we mentioned earlier other which is that if the hadith is consistent and agrees with the Quran it is possible that it will be correct and we should accept it but if it contradicts the Quran then it does not become a part of Islamic theology or Islamic law or Islamic ethics so in the same way that we should not cherry pick verses of the Quran we shouldn't just jump to a book of hadith and say well this one looks like it supports my argument so I'm gonna use that one or this one goes against me so I'm not gonna use that one I'm just gonna completely avoid it we have to see which one actually agrees with the Quran and the other criteria that are very important as well and then determine whether it's true or not Thank you. Um, well that, that's how things work in theory um, in, in, in practice, in actuality, it goes something like this. We go to the Quran, we decide how we want to interpret the Quran, then we go and find hadiths that line up with our interpretation and throw out hadiths that don't line up with our interpretation. That's how things actually tend to work uh, in Islam. Let me give you an example. Uh, we've quoted chapter 9, verse 29 of the Quran. Fight those who do not believe in Allah nor the last day. That sounds like it's saying, um, again, unless you have some reason to interpret it otherwise, it sounds like it's saying exactly what it says. Fight those who do not believe in Allah nor the last day. Now, you can go to the Hadith and find Muhammad in so-called authentic narrations saying, I've been commanded to fight people until they recite the Shahada and pray their daily prayers and give the, give the required alms. In other words, fight them until they become Muslims and do what Muslims are supposed to do. So you would say, oh, here's what this verse sound li sounds like, and I find Muhammad saying the exact same thing, so this is how Muhammad is interpreting it. Obviously, Muhammad knows how to interpret the Quran, therefore, since this passes all the criteria of, a, of, a true, uh, of an authentic hadith, this is an authentic hadith. That's, that, that's how things would work in my mind, but in actuality, especially if you're a Muslim in the West, it would go something like, um, Muhammad, I mean, Allah says in the Quran, fight those who do not believe in Allah. He doesn't mean that because he says other things elsewhere. Therefore, he can't mean that. Therefore, when Muhammad says in the Hadith, in a so-called authentic narration, fight the, I, I've been commanded to fight people until they recite the Shahada and do the Islamic things, it can't be an authentic Hadith. We have to throw that one out. That's how things tend to work in practice. Um, and that's why we're going to have some disagreements here because it seems everything's coming down to uh, a particular interpretation of the Quran deciding our methodology rather than the methodology deciding uh, what the Quran means. In reality, the Hadith all date from the ninth century and none of them have any historical value at all. So the idea that we are finding some that are authentic and others that aren't it's just really a, uh, a, an exercise in futility. But in Islamic theology, if they have an isnad chain, the chain of transmitters going back to people who knew Muhammad, then, and that chain is unbroken and all the narrators are reliable, then it's considered authentic. And there are authentic collections. There are six authentic collections of hadith among the Sunnis, and then among the Shia, there are other collections that are deemed authentic that are generally accepted. Uh, I have a, a, a one volume of al kafi here. And the general consensus is that if a narration, if a story is in one of those volumes, then the presumption is that it's authentic. It only becomes inauthentic when it becomes inconvenient as a point of debate because it illustrates that Islam is enjoining violence. And then it's deemed inauthentic in a debate setting. But ordinarily in Islamic tradition, these things, if they're in the authentic hadith, then Muslims consider them normative for Islamic law. Thank you. Uh, due to the lack of time, we're going to have to stop there with the questions and move on to the closing statements portion of the debate. We're going to ask now for our guest panel to have 10 minutes to present their clothing, closing statements. Well, we've uh, heard some questions about why the about why there are people uh, 
from really around the world, groups around the world who are misinterpreting the Quran, especially uh, over the past 14 centuries, uh, why they're misinterpreting the Quran on the issue of violence. And I just want to uh, I want to be clear here, when we talk about people misinterpreting what the Quran teaches, this includes some of the greatest, most respected Islamic scholars of all time, because they happen to agree with what I've said, what Robert has said, about, uh, about the, what the Quran teaches. That doesn't mean that all scholars have said this. Many scholars have it. Uh, but we're, we're pointing out that this sort of misinterpretation can be found in some of the most respected Muslim scholars and hadith collections and histories uh, in the history of Islam. So why is there such misunderstanding? Uh, well, let's go ahead and, and read a passage very quickly, and this is the conclusion, so we'll conclude with this. Um, I'm going to go ahead and read the entire passage in context of Surah 9, verse 29. We'll start at verse 28, uh, where... Uh, Muhammad had declared that the pagans can no longer take the pilgrimage to Mecca, and the Meccans were worried, where are we going to get money from now? Because they got a lot of money from the pagans and polytheists coming to Mecca for the pilgrimage. Uh, so, verse 28, this begins the passage, begins with, O you who believe. O you who believe, truly the pagans are unclean, so let them not, after this year of theirs, approach the sacred mosque. And if you fear poverty, if you're worried about losing money from not having the pagans there anymore, soon Allah will enrich you, if he wills, out of his bounty, for Allah is all-knowing, all-wise. So Allah is going to enrich them to make up for the lost money. How is he going to enrich them? Next verse, fight those who believe not in Allah, nor the last day, nor hold that forbidden, which hath been forbidden by Allah and his messenger, nor acknowledge the religion of truth from among the people of the book, Jews and Christians, until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. Notice, every criticism offered against the Jews and Christians there, and justification for fighting us, has to do with what we believe uh, or what we, uh, what we do. So the question here is, but I thought, according to Surah 2, verse 62, as Sayyid Atik quoted earlier, I thought Jews and Christians were fine with Allah. We're believers too, right? Next verse, the Jews call Ezra, son of God, and the Christians call Christ, the son of God. That is a saying from their mouth, in this they but imitate what the unbelievers of old used to say, Allah's curse be on them, how they are deluded away from the truth. Notice, it's condemning us for what we say about Jesus. Well, where is the self-defense here? Where, why are Muslims commanded to fight if it's all about what we believe and what we say? Maybe it's in the next verse. They take their priests, and their rabbis to be their lords in derogation of Allah. And they take as their Lord Christ the son of Mary, yet they were commanded to worship but one God. There is no God but he, praise and glory to him, far is he from having the partners they associate with him. Nothing there, maybe the next verse. Fain would they extinguish Allah's light with their mouths. Notice we're extinguishing Allah's light with our mouths, talking about what we say, what we preach about Jesus. Fain would they extinguish Allah's light with their mouths, but Allah will not allow, but that his light should be perfected, even though the unbelievers may detest it. Well, Allah is not going to allow us to extinguish his light with our mouths. What's he going to do? Next verse. It is he who has sent his messenger with guidance and the religion of truth to prevail it over all religion, even though the pagans may detest it. That's the end of the section. So Allah sent Muhammad to stop us from extinguishing Allah's light. How is Allah going to stop us from what we say, from what we preach, from extinguishing Allah's light with our mouths? That's the entire passage, 929. Fight those who do not believe until we pay the jizya, feel ourselves subdued. We are subjugated until we're not allowed to preach. As we're not allowed to preach in countries like Saudi Arabia, governed by Sunnis, countries like Iran, governed by Shias. So, why are so many people misinterpreting the Quran? Because Allah claims over and over again in the Quran, like a beating drum, that he is perfectly clear in his commands. We go to a passage like 929, we look for any hint of self-defense, we can't find it. Now, can you say, oh, well, you know, we go to these earlier Meccan chapters or whatever, and you have to interpret it in the light of that, and you have to go to the Arabic and become a scholar and all this. That's not what Allah says. He says it's clear in his commands. And if it says something different in earlier revelations, you don't say, well, now this one isn't clear anymore, therefore we have to go to some earlier revelation. Allah says in the Quran, chapter 2, verse 106, his method of, interpret his method of interpretation is one of abrogation. And so I see two possibilities here. First possibility is that Allah means what he says. 
When he says that his revelations are clear, that, you, uh, that, that later revelations can abrogate or cancel earlier revelations, and therefore, when he says something peaceful, that's exactly what he means in that historical context. When he says fight those who do not believe, that's exactly what he means in that sort of situation. So Allah is clear. That's one possibility. If that is the correct interpretation, then the Quran does not promote peace. The other possibility is that Allah is really trying to promote peace, but he keeps saying things like fight those who do not believe, and he's laid down abrogation as his method, and we go to all these other Muslim sources and they talk about fighting people based on their beliefs. And so it's, if, if, if Allah doesn't mean this, but he's made the only sort of coherent interpretation, one where you have certain stages and once you have the final stage, then you violently subjugate people in the name of Allah, if that's the only coherent interpretation, then even if Allah meant something else, he didn't say it very clearly. In which case, the Quran still does not promote peace because Allah accidentally said a bunch of very violent things. Just to amplify on what David says, the Quran says, uh, Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. Those who follow him are merciful to one another, but harsh to the unbelievers. That's chapter 48, verse 29. Then in chapter 60, verse 4, Abraham says to his father, we have rejected you and there has appeared between us and you hostility and hatred forever until you believe in Allah alone. And there are many other passages as such. Uh, chapter 9, verse 123, fight those of the disbelievers who are close to you and let them find harshness in you. Now, if there's enmity and hatred between the believers and the unbelievers, and the, un the believers have to be harsh to the unbelievers, there is an aspect of warfare to this that illuminates why, as David also illuminated, so many Muslims seem to get the impression that they have a responsibility before Allah to wage war against unbelievers. In chapter 2, verse 85, it says that the unbelievers will get disgrace in this world and on the day of resurrection. Now, how are the unbelievers to whom the Muslims have to be harsh, and there's enmity and hatred between them and the unbelievers forever, how is it that the unbelievers are going to suffer in this world? Allah is not likely, or at least not so far, has parted the heavens and come down and punished the unbelievers in this world. But the Quran also directs in chapter 9, verse 14, fight against them so that Allah will punish them through your hands. That the unbelievers have to be punished in this world and Allah will punish the unbelievers by the hands of the Muslims. And so it's very clear as the book says itself in many cl pl places, that it's a clear book, that the Quran teaches that uh, believers in Islam ought to have hostility toward unbelievers and ought to fight against them so that they can be the instruments of the punishment of Allah against the unbelievers in this world. And unfortunately, there are all too many Muslims who understand the Quran in exactly that way and are behaving in that way. And so I end as I began by saying that if you truly believe in what you're saying here, that Islam teaches peace, I hope you are making very strenuous efforts within your own community to make sure that this very widespread misunderstanding of Islam doesn't spread further and that all Muslims will believe as you do that Islam teaches peace. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Said Atif and Sheikh Sahawat Hussain will have 10 minutes to present their closing statement. One thing we should very quickly notice is that we quoted two of the most heavily cited verses of the Quran used by the anti Islam movement to show that the Quran is a violent book, but we show that it is actually peaceful and instead of responding to it, they are completely hush about it. For example, chapter 9 verse 5, which is supposedly called the verse of the sword, which says, kill the polytheists wherever you find them. But the verses before and the verses after show that it is in self-defense and it is limited to the ethical limits of warfare. 
completely hush about it. Or verse chapter 4, verse 89. In so many of their videos and writings, I'm sure many of you have seen their videos and writings, you'll see that they quote these two, 9.5 and 4.89, so many times as verses of violence, but the context when you read it is absolutely the opposite. So, when it suits them, now they're going to try to use the context, for example, chapter 9, verse 29, to try to show, oh, now we're going to read the context, but if the wording of the verse itself clearly shows that it is not talking about just general people, but it's talking about those people who are killing and are massacring, then whatever the context says does not apply to that verse. Verse 929 says, fight those who do not believe in Allah or the last day, and they do not hold sacred what Allah has held sacred. And as we explained, that terminology is very clearly only used in the Quran to refer to the sanctity of human life. So it is referring to the sanctity of human life and nothing else. And one who misunderstands and doesn't get the nuances of the Arabic language or the language of the Quran in this way should not be passing judgments on the Quran. So if you misunderstand the verse, which is very clear to us, then you will think it's violent when we know that it's actually in self-defense. So the Quran is clear, but the Quran has also said that it has been revealed in the Arabic language. So if we are going to get a basic understanding of the Quran, yes, we can read translations. If I just want to go to Sunday school, if I want to learn, get elementary classes on Islam, I can th read through the translations. But if I want to start passing judgments on the religion and on the scripture, if I want to pass judgments that this book is a violent book and there's no other way possible, then I have to become a scholar and I have to become an expert in the language of that scripture. And this is the same one reading words like disbelievers. Disbelievers doesn't always just mean all disbelievers. For us, it's clear who understand the Quran properly, we interpret it properly, that sometimes it means those disbelievers that are attacking you and you must perform self-defense against them. And anyone who has experience with different languages knows that sometimes certain words and certain phrases cannot be encapsulated into a single word or a single phrase in another language. This is sometimes completely impossible. And yes, I appreciate that Mr. Robert Spencer encouraged us to fight against these terrorists? Yes, we do, and we fight on two fronts. We're fighting against the terrorists who misinterpret the Quran on one side, and we are intellectually fighting against the anti-Islam movement and misinterprets the Quran on the other side by saying that the Quran is a book of violence. So just to give you some examples of what are the results of saying that the Quran is a book of violence and that Islam is a violent religion, this has repercussions all across society. Ben Carson, who was a former presidential candidate and who is now the head of the top Department of Housing and Urban Development, he said that a Muslim shouldn't be president. President Donald Trump has said during the campaign that Islam hates us. Former presidential candidate Herman Cain said he would not appoint a Muslim to his cabinet or as a federal judge because, quote, there is this creeping attempt to gradually ease Sharia law and the Muslim faith into our government. Former Arkansas Governor Mike Huckabee said, can someone explain to me why it is that we tiptoe around a religion that promotes the most murderous mayhem on the planet so the Muslims will go to the mosque and they come out of there like uncorked animals, throwing rocks and burning cars. The same Huckabee, he objected to churches that rent space to Muslims like Berean Presbyterian Church has done today by saying if the purpose of a church is to push forth the gospel of Jesus Christ and then you have a Muslim group that says that Jesus Christ and all the people that follow him are a bunch of infidels who should be essentially obliterated, I guess I have a hard time understanding that. So Huckabee, a governor, a former presidential candidate, a media personality thinks that Muslims believe that Jesus is an infidel. This is how far the anti-Islam propaganda has gone. That we Muslims, we believe that Jesus is one of the greatest prophets of God and we are awaiting his return to bring peace to the world. To give some further examples, former Congressman Alan West, a very respected congressman, he had a meme on his Facebook page that said that at that time the incoming General Mattis would, quote, exterminate Muslims. Ted Cruz, a supposed champion of the Constitution, said that law enforcement should, quote, patrol and secure Muslim neighborhoods before they become radicalized. Recently, about a month ago, an Afghan team of female engineers was prevented from entering the United States for a robotics tournament, and they were only allowed entry after public outcry, while at the same time, the captain of the team's father was killed by an ISIS suicide attack on a Shia mosque. So on one side, she's being stopped by anti-Islam propaganda. On the other side, her family is being killed by ISIS. Jeremy Christian, verbally abused 
a group of Muslim women on a Portland train because he thought that they were Muslim. Three heroic individuals intervened, two of them were killed, and the third was injured. And his Facebook page had a meme that read, if we're removing statues because of the civil war, we should be removing mosques because of 9-11. And if, in case anyone is wondering, police said that his record did not show any record of mental illness. In October 2016, police in liberal Kansas intercepted an anti-Islam terrorist group called the Crusaders. They were planning a Timothy McVeigh style bombing on an apartment complex that mostly housed Somalian refugees. So some of the comments that are recorded from them after they were arrested and during their arrest, they said literally every blank apartment, while referring to how many Somalis lived there, that's all it is, blank, blank cockroaches. I'm sure you understand what the blank stand for. They plan to use explosives and then to go in and shoot the survivors. They said, there's no leaving anyone behind, even if it's a one-year-old. I'm serious. I guarantee if I go on a mission, those little blanks are going bye-bye. And they justified this by saying that all of them, or the majority of them, were of fighting age. And ironically, ironically, when they went to court, the group's defense team argued that fake news had convinced the Crusaders that the U.S. was in a state of emergency. So their defense team blamed anti-Islam propaganda for radicalizing the Crusaders to hate Islam and Muslims. So the anti-Islam movement tells people that the Quran commands people to kill non-believers without provocation, to force non-believers to convert, to force non-believers to become second-class citizens, to replace all world governments with an Islamic government, and that all throughout this they are lying to achieve their goals. So if you convince people that this is true, then they will view all Muslims with fear, anger, and paranoia. This is the result of what happens. We should be very clear about the consequences of our words. Those who misinterpret the Quran are morally responsible for the crimes that are a result of their false propaganda. These people who do, do these actions, to give you an example, the Norwegian terrorist who skilled, killed scores by the name of Anders Breivik, he wrote a 1500 page manifesto before he committed this terrorist act and he heavily quoted our respected guest panelists Robert Spencer as justification, as inspiration, as the reason for why he went into this. And in his defense, of course, in his defense, yes, in his defense, in his defense, Mr. Robert Spencer did say that whoever gets the idea that you should go ahead and kill people from the things that he writes, he said they're crazy. In his defense, of course, he doesn't agree with that. We're not saying that he does. But we're just putting forth the idea of what happens that when you say something and you cause an entire community and an entire religion to be feared, to make people think that they're constantly coming to attack you, that there's worldwide conspiracy of 1.8 billion Muslims, then what do you think is going to happen to people who believe this and they want to protect their families, they want to protect their country? Do you think that some of them are just going to sit around and let this happen? if they think that this is going to happen. No. When the Quran is misinterpreted, Muslims lose to terrorists on one side and we lose to the anti-Islam movement on the other side. Terrorists like ISIS are wrong about Islam. The anti-Islam movement is wrong about Islam. There are absolutely no verses of violence or aggression in the Quran. As we explained, the Quran only promotes peace through justice. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much. I appreciate your participation, dear guests, and all of you audience. The presentation was very nice. Let me sum up within two minutes. First, the word jihad is not used only for fighting. Al Kadu Ayalihi Kal Mujahidi Fi Sabilillah, who goes to earn the money for himself and his family. Islam says he is doing jihad. Imam Ali says, Law tamassal ali al-faqr la qataltu, law tamassal ali al-jahlu la qataltu. If I see arrogance and ignorance or poverty, I'm going to kill both of them. It does mean the qital and jihad is, only, is not only fighting against the human beings. My humble request from both guests is, you find there are a lot of contradiction in the Bibles. The Bible which I learned when I was in college is different than the Bible which I see in New York today. 
but Quran is the same. Quran was never changed. I read in the Bible in Naulakha Church that there will be Imam Mahdi coming and behind him Jesus is going to offer the prayer. So Jesus is going to offer the prayer behind any terrorist or promoter of the terrorist. I humbly request all of you please understand the Islam and Quran. Islam is the religion of peace and silm, Islam is not only submission. Islam means silm which means peace. That is why we say salamu alaikum, peace upon all of you. And I end my humble talk with this, with this salamu alaikum, peace be upon all of you. May Allah bless you all. May Allah bless United States of America. May Allah bless reveal religion followers and may Allah give us unity as Quran says, Ta'alaw ila kalimatin sawa'im baynana wa baynakum. Allah na'budu illa Allah wa la nushrik bihi ahada. Quran is claiming, come toward unity. O oh, people of book, come toward unity. And Prophet, if he delivered this hadith to kill them until they say shahada, la ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. So how come he did not kill those Jews and Christians who were having, capturing the market of Medina and they were never killed by prophet or army. And uh, when they stopped them to come into al kaaba because they were showing their worship as a naked. You will kick them out if they come in downtown of Philadelphia as a naked. Police will arrest them. These were the reasons. If you go and review the facts, you will find Islam is the true religion of the world. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the debate portion of our program. Both sides were given an equal opportunity to present their arguments and the decision remains to each person's reasoning.